بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فإن أحسن الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وإن شر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار In the last lesson we looked at the commentary of Sheikh Zayd Al-Madkhali rahimahullah ta'ala on the third principle, the third of the four principles and just for the sake of revision and uh, remembrance, we'll read through the text again uh, of the third principle. And in this lesson, we'll try to complete the explanation of uh, Sheikh Ubaid al-Jabiri and Sheikh Ahmed al-Najmi, rahimahullah. And we'll make a start on the explanation of Sheikh Muhammad bin Hadi, inshallah ta'ala. So Sheikh al-Islam Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, Al-Qa'idatu Thalitha. أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم ظهر على أناس متفرقين في عباداتهم. The Prophet Sallam appeared amongst the people who were diverse in their worship, meaning that in that which they worshipped, they were divided and separated because they were worshipping diverse deities, many different deities. منهم من يعبد الملائكة Amongst them were those who worshipped the angels. وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَعْبُدُ الْأَنْبِيَاءَ وَالصَّالِحِينَ Amongst them were those who worshipped the prophets and the righteous. وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَعْبُدُ الْأَحْجَارَ وَالْأَشْجَارَ Amongst them were those who worshipped the trees and the stones. وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَعْبُدُ الشَّمْسَ وَالْقَمَرَ Amongst them were those who worshipped the sun and the moon. وَقَاتَلَهُمْ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمْ وَلَمْ يُفَرِّقْ بَيْنَهُمْ and the Prophet ﷺ, he fought against them all and did not distinguish between any of them. What Dalilu qawluhu ta'ala, the evidence for that, so first of all, a general evidence is, وَقَاتِلُوهُمْ حَتَّى لَا تَكُونَ فِتْنَةٌ وَيَكُونَ الدِّينُ كُلُّهُ لِلَّهِ So fight them until there is no more tribulation and all of the religion is for Allah. What Dalilu al-Shamsi wal-Qamar qawluhu ta'ala and the evidence for the sun and the moon their worship with respect to the sun and the moon, is the saying of the Most High, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ اللَّيْلُ وَالنَّهَارُ وَالشَّمْسُ وَالشَّمْسُ وَالْقَمَرُ لَا تَسْجُدُوا لِلشَّمْسِ وَلَا لِلْقَمَرُ وَاسْجُدُوا لِلَّهِ الَّذِي خَلَقَهُنَّ إِن كُنْتُمْ إِيَّاهُ تَعْبُدُونَ From his signs are the night and the day and the sun and the moon. Do not prostrate to the sun nor to the moon, but prostrate to Allah, the one who created them, if indeed it is him that you worship. وَدَلِلُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ Evidence for the angels قوله تعالى is his saying the most high وَلَا يَأْمُرَكُمْ أَن تَتَّخِذُ الْمَلَائِكَةَ وَالنَّبِيِّينَ أَرْبَابًا He has not commanded you that you take the angels and the prophets as lords meaning lords besides Allah وَدَلِلُ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ قوله تعالى Evidence with respect to the prophets is his the most high saying وَإِذْ قَالَ اللَّهُ يَا عِيسَى بْنَ مَرْيَمَ أَأَنْتَ قُلْتَ لِلنَّاسِ اتَّخِذُونِي وَأُمِّيَّ وَالْإِلَاهِينَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ When Allah said, O Isa, the son of Mary, did you say to the people, take me and my mother as two deities besides Allah? قَالَ سُبْحَانَكَ He will say, glorified be you. مَا يَكُونُ لِي أَنْ أَقُولَ مَا لَيْسَ لِي بِحَقَّ It is not for me to say that which I have no right to say. إِنْ كُنْتُ قُلْتُهُ فَقَدْ عَلِمْتَهُ If I had said it, you would have known it. تَعْلَمُ مَا فِي نَفْسِي وَلَا أَعْلَمُ مَا فِي نَفْسِكَ You know that which is in myself, I do not know that which is in yourself. إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ عَلَّامُ الْغُيُوبِ Indeed, you are the knower of all things which are hidden. وَالدَّلِيلُ الصَّالِحِينَ قَوْلُهُ تَعَالَى The evidence for the righteous is his the most saying. أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ يَبْتَغُونَ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهِمُ الْوَسِيلَةِ أَيُّهُمْ أَقْرَبُ وَيَرْجُونَ رَحْمَتَهُ وَيَخَافُونَ عَذَابَهُ إِنَّ عَذَابَ رَبِّكَ كَانَ مَحْذُورًا Those whom they call upon themselves seek a means of nearness to their Lord and they to see which of them is closest 
and they hope in his mercy and they fear his punishment. Indeed, the punishment of your Lord is that is what is something to be aware of and to be to be cautious of, to be fearful of. What the Lilul Ahjari wal Ashjari Qawluhu Ta'ala and the evidence for the stones in the trees is his the most high, is his the most high saying Afara'aytumul Lata wal Uzza wa manat al thalithat al ukhra Have you not seen Allat and Al Uzza, the names of two deities, and Manat, the, the, the other third of them? And these were deities that were trees or stones in which were worshipped besides Allah. And finally, he says, وَحَدِيثُ أَبِي وَاقِدٍ اللَّيْثِي رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ The hadith of Abi Waqid. قَالَ He said, خَرَجْنَا مَعَ النَّبِيِّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَمْ إِلَى حُنَيْن That we set out with the Prophet وسلم, to Hunayn. وَنَحْنُ حُدَثَاءُ أَحْذٍ بِكُفْر We had only recently left Kufr, disbelief. وَلِلْمُشْرِكِينَ سِدْرَةٌ يَعْكُفُونَ عِنْدَهَا وَيَنُوطُونَ بِهَا أَسْلِحَتَهُمْ and the mushriks, the pagans, had a tree, a low tree, that they would revolve around, and that they would spend time around, and that they would hang their weapons upon it. يُقَالُ لَهَا ذَاتُ أَنْوَاتٍ It would be called ذَاتُ أَنْوَاتٍ فَمَرَرْنَا بِسِدْرَةٍ فَقُلْنَا يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ اِجْعَلْ لَنَا ذَاتَ أَنْوَاتٍ كَمَا لَهُمْ ذَاتُ أَنْوَاتٍ To the end of the hadith. So we passed by a low tree, and so we said to the messenger, O Messenger of Allah, make for us a that and what, meaning a similar tree, like they have a that and what, to the end of the hadith. So, this, uh, we begin with the ex commentary of Sheikh Ubaid al Jabari, Hafizahullah ta'ala. And so the Sheikh says, uh, the, there are basically um, three or four benefits that the Sheikh uh, presents here. And so the first point is, that despite the fact that all of these people which are mentioned in these verses, which are alluded to in these verses, despite the fact that they were all worshipping different things. Some were worshipping the sun, the moon, the trees, the stones, the angels, the righteous, the jinn, the prophets, the, and so on and so forth. Despite all of that, there is one thing that unites them. So, divided and different in the deities, but united by one thing. United by one thing. And that one thing is a shirku billah. That they are committing shirk with Allah. So what is it that unites them? And what is it that separates them? That which unites them is that they are worshipping other than Allah and thereby setting up a rival to Allah. An equal to Allah. A nid to Allah. An equal, a kufu with Allah, a sharik, a partner with Allah. This is the thing that unites them all. But what is the thing that separates them all? The thing that separates them is that this one is making the sun a partner to Allah. This one is making the moon a partner to Allah. This one is making the star a partner to Allah. This one is making a prophet a partner to Allah. This one is making a righteous one a partner to Allah. This one is making a stone or a tree or other than that. So that is, the, that is what divides them all. Once we understand this, that irrespective of what they are worshipping, they are in fact united by one thing, which is their shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then this makes it clear that anyone who takes a nid, a rival, along with Allah, then his claim to Islam cannot be accepted. It can never be accepted. Even if he prays, even if he fasts, even if he claims that he is a Muslim. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not accept any worship unless and until it is made purely for his sake alone, made only for him, uh, for him alone. So this is the first point. This is the first benefit that we take from this uh, passage. The second benefit is that Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab rahimahullah ta'ala he first of all, after mentioning that the deities were different, he brought a general proof. A general proof. The general proof is the first verse which he mentioned, which is in Surah Al-Baqarah. This is a general proof in refutation of all of these different manifestations of shirk. And this is the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَقَاتِلُوهُمْ 
hatta la takuna fitnatun wa yakuna ad-din kulluhu lillah which means to fight against them fight against them until there is no more tribulation and until the deen all of it is for Allah what does this mean it means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded his prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to uh, fight against those people until all of them are united upon worshiping a single deity and until there is no one who has a right no one has a right to be worshiped except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so he said wa yakuna ad-din kulluhu lillah until all of the deen deen meaning the devotion and the worship that is given until all of that is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala meaning that when he was sent to all these different people amongst them were those who worshiped the angels from them the the stars the sun the moon the prophets the righteous stones trees this one ayah this one verse is a refutation of all of that worship in other words that he was sent to oppose and to eradicate all that worship until worship is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so he made no distinction those who worshiped the stones and the trees are not distinct from those who worship the righteous the righteous dead or those who worship the prophets there is no distinction or the jinn or the angels so therefore it shows there is no argument if one says that i do not worship a stone i don't worship a stone i don't believe that the stone creates this is absurd so he's trying to distance himself from those who worship stones and trees whose falsehood is known the point being here that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this ayah did not distinguish between one ma'bud and another ma'bud he didn't distinguish between the stone and the tree and the angel and the prophet and the jinn and the star and the sun and the moon rather he declared all of that something that is to be fought against until the deen belongs only to allah so this ayah we have we have to understand what is the istidlal what is the angle of evidence from which uh, this verse is being used and on account of which this verse is being placed first in this third principle it is that this is a general proof for the futility of shirk in all of its manifestations irrespective of what is being worshiped irrespective so these are the main examples given in the quran stars trees rocks stones the moon the sun prophets angels jinn and so on and so forth but a person could be worshiping anything and it wouldn't make any difference you can worship a date a date stone you can worship a table you can worship a piece of wood a statue you can worship an animal an elephant you can worship the rain the mountains you can worship anything all of that there is no distinction in any of that until even the prophets and the righteous that does not exempt a person from the judgment of shirk which is clearly outlined in the quran so that was the general proof as for the detail proofs then as we've seen we read through the verses the verses pertaining to the sun and the the the, the moon and the, the the angels and the prophets and the righteous and stones and trees all of that is clear that is apparent to us the sheikh says that these evidences are sariha wadiha they are very apparent very clear very plain and all of these are different forms of deities worshiped by the mushrikeen however the sheikh says we need to focus upon the final evidence in this third principle and this is the evidence in the hadith of abi waqid al-laythi radiyallahu anhu there are some important lessons from this important benefits from this and there are three benefits that the sheikh brings to our attention the first of those benefits is that the 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 mere name no matter what you call something no matter what you label something does not change its reality and this is the the principle that we derive from this incident which happened that the that that the name of a thing does not change its reality what does this mean 
we see that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when those people and they were sahaba radiallahu anhum they were companions and they accepted Islam right at the very end this was right towards when Mecca was conquered right towards the end of the messengership and their statement the statement that they made when they said ij'al lana dhat anwatin kama lahum dhat anwatin make for us this uh that that anwat make for us just as they have a that anwat so because the mushrikeen used to call this tree they used to give it a name they used to say that anwatin so the sahaba because they didn't have knowledge of Tawheed and what violates it They said make for us Adhatu Anwatin They used the same name The same label To refer to the same thing that the Mushrikeen Were referring to Or that, that, that which they used to worship So we find That the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam When he heard this from them He likened them to the Bani Israel he likened them to the Bani Israel. And when we see that what did these companions say and what did Bani Israel say? In other words, the companion said, make for us a that and what. But what did Bani Israel say? And this is mentioned in the Quran. Let's compare and contrast. First of all, these companions said to the Prophet ﷺ, Ya Rasul Allah Ya Rasul Allah They said, O Messenger of Allah They called him With the name of Risala Meaning they acknowledged That he is the Messenger of Allah And it, it proves that they loved The Messenger of Allah And it proves that they loved to follow To make ittiba Of the Messenger of Allah And that the affair of religion The whole affair of religion One's devotion is founded upon loving the Messenger of Allah. So they called him with this name, Ya Rasul Allah, Ya Rasul Allah, O Messenger of Allah. What did Bani Israel, what did they say? What did they say to Musa? They said, Ya Musa, Ya Musa. Look at how they did not address him as a messenger. They addressed him in the same way that any common person would, would address anybody else By way of his name Ya Musa This is from the extremity of disrespect and crudeness They did not, they did not say O oh, Nabi Allah, O oh, Prophet of Allah, Ya Rasul Allah They said Ya Musa, Ya Musa This is the first thing The second thing is that the companions of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what word did they use? They said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, make for us a tree, make for us a that and what, upon which we can hang our weapons. This is what they meant. Make for us a tree. This is the word that they used. This word is not an explicit request to set up a deity. To set up another object of worship It wasn't an explicit word Whereas when we look at the companions of Musa Alayhi salam What did they ask? What did they say? They said Ij'al lana ilahan Ij'al lana ilahan Make for us a deity They explicitly used the word ilahan Ij'al lana ilahan Make for us a deity this is a, an explicit request from them for shirk. Make for us a deity besides Allah. This is an explicit statement of shirk. They are asking, make us a deity besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Set up, set, up, set up as a deity alongside or besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, this is, and this is the point. So, the statement of Bani Israel was explicit. In requesting that which is shirk Whereas the statement of the companions Was not explicit The wording was different Bani Israel said Ij'al lana ilahan Whereas the companion said Ij'al lana dhata anwatin Make for us 
idhat anwat. This is not explicit in asking for a deity, rather they just simply use the name that was used by the mushrikeen. So it wasn't it wasn't explicit. However, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam did not distinguish between them both. Why? Because he cited that ayah in the Quran, he cited that example of the companions of Musa alayhi salam, intending by that to liken the statement of his companions to the statement of those uh, companions of Musa who explicitly demanded shirk, requested shirk. Why? What, what was the intent here? The intent here is that the names, changing the name does not change the reality. Changing the name does not change the reality because that which the mushrikeen were doing of hanging their weapons upon this tree, seeking barakah, seeking benefit and things which are only in the power and control of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then this is setting up an ilah min dunillah besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no difference in the haqiqah even though the label and the name used is slightly uh, different. And then the third benefit, the third benefit is the inkar of the munkar at its time. And this is a very important benefit uh, which, should, which, which we should pay attention to. That rejection of the evil is at its time. Meaning that when the evil is there, that the evil should be rejected there and then. And even if it involves harshness and severity. And in this, the Shaykh says, is a refutation of some of those people who like to philosophize, who like to use philosophy and to like to philosophize about things. And likewise, those often those weak people who ascribe to Salafi. And many of these people you see, they ascribe to Salafi, they ascribe to the Salafi manhaj, but you see from them statements which, which clearly demonstrate that they have not understood the... Uh, the, the deen of Islam in the detail in which it should be understood. And so this incident here highlights to us this important point, which is that you find many of these people from the uh, Hizbiyin and from those who even ascribe to Salafiyya, and you see these amazing, strange remarks from them. They say, when it comes to correcting the people, correcting their beliefs, correcting their methodologies, explaining to them that this is shirk and this is tawheed. This is kufr and this is iman. This is, so when, when it, this is sunnah, this is bid'ah. What do they say? They say, well, هذا ليس وقته. That this is not its time. It's not time for this. Let's just leave this and delay this because why the ummah is in crisis right now. There is turmoil, there is bloodshed. There is splitting, there is differing, there is weakness. We need unity. We need to be united like other people are united. They forget all the differences. Look at the, as they say, look at the Yahud, for example. Look at how they are united in every part of the world and they work together. Despite the fact that they are all separate. This is what these people say. This shows their jahal, their ignorance of the foundations of the deen of Islam. And this incident involving these companions who are new to Islam and this request that they made highlights to us a number of things. First of all, let's look at the situation, the uh, social situation. First of all, the ones who made this remark, who were with the Prophet ﷺ, the Shaykh says that there were approximately one-sixth or one-fifth of the army. The army that was on its way to fight against the, you know, the, to, uh, Hawzan and Thaqif to these various places to fight against the, the, the Mushrikeen. There were approximately one sixth or one fifth of the army. That is not a small number of people. This is not as if it is two people, three people, four people that are with you on some minor, uh, minuscule skirmish. This is a large number of people, a large number of people. And um, so, first of all, this is the number of people, a large number of people. The second thing is that look at the time in which this took place. 
this was in a time in which they were actually involved in battle. It is not the case that they were getting ready and making preparations and getting ready to go out on the journey. They were already on the journey. They were already in the journey. They were already on the way to the enemy. And they were on the way to Hauzan and Thaqif. And it became clear that when they fell into this opposition in this very crucial time and this crucial situation of when they were almost on the verge of fighting or going towards fighting and there were a large number of people, what do we see? We see that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not say, well, let us delay this issue. We are now engaged in something very, very important and crucial. Let's just delay this until after the battle is finished or maybe until afterwards and then we can correct this issue and deal with it then. No, the Prophet did not do that. Rather, he reprimanded them uh, with a, in a severe way and he likened their action to the action of Bani Israel who said, اِجْعَلْ لَنَا إِلَاهًا Make for us an ilah like they have aliha just like they have, just like they have deities. And um, he did not say, well, these people are new to Islam. If I was to be severe upon them, maybe they will turn away. And maybe they will leave and, you know, turn away and leave. Rather, he did not do that. Rather, he announced and he said that this issue opposes the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so he gave them a stern and severe uh, reprimand. Until this whole idea of requesting this that and what, it completely left their hearts. This request that entails shirk, it completely was removed from their hearts by way of this admonition of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And of course, there are some. This is this is the end of the explanation of Sheikh Obaid al Jabri, hafizahullahu taala wa jazahullahu khaira. Uh, but an additional point that can be mentioned here as well, which of course we find mentioned in the writings of many of the other scholars who speak of the importance of Tawheed in victory and success. Now these people in the army were on the way to make the word of Allah supreme and making the word of Allah supreme, the Tawheed of Allah, the declaration that there is none which has the right to be worshipped except Allah. How can that be made? How can that be established? How can victory be received? If the likes of this request is made by the very people who are supposed to be raising the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this shows also that victory, ta'yid and nasr, support, aid and victory is not given except upon tawheed and the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa recognizing that he reprimanded them and he corrected them. And he removed all of these shirky inclinations that might have been in their hearts because of ignorance, because of being new to, because of being new to Islam and having only recently left disbelief that he removed all of that inclination from their hearts up until their hearts were, were, were safe and secure and upon the tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we compare and contrast this to the way of those misguided, deviant, straying wanderers like the Ikhwanul Muslimin and other than them, who knowing full well, who knowing full well what the Ummah is in of the worship of idols besides Allah in the form of the tombs of the dead, like Ahmed al Badawi in Egypt and Sinjar and Ad Dusuqi and other than them. Or no matter which Muslim country we look at in the East and the West, in Indonesia, in Malaysia, in, in, in Pakistan, and likewise in, in India, uh, where there are large, a large number of Muslims too, all across North Africa, in all of these places we see them steeped in the likes of this. And yet, these people who claim to be rectifying the affair of the Muslimin, we see them opposing the way the manhaj of the Prophet ﷺ, which is clearly exemplified in this statement, in this narration of Abu Waqid al-Layfi radiallahu ta'ala anhu. This now leads us to the, state, the brief, very brief explanation of Shaykh Ahmed al-Najmi 
rahimahullah ta'ala and we'll conclude our lesson with this uh, discussion it is only a page half a page long so after mentioning all of the third principle and all of the various texts uh, Sheikh Ahmed rahimahullah ta'ala he says that what this principle is essentially telling us what it essentially contains is that everything which is invoked everything which is called upon besides Allah whether it be the angels the prophets the righteous the trees the stones and all other things besides them they are completely incapable they have no power they are unable to aid and support and help their worshippers with anything that is requested from them or to save them and deliver them from anything that the ones who call upon them are trying to flee from rather Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has informed that everything which is invoked and called upon besides him does not have control or power over anything at all as he says in surah fatir surah 35 uh, at the beginning of the surah verses 13 to 14 وَالَّذِينَ تَدْعُونَ مِن دُونِهِ مَا يَمْلِكُونَ مِن قِطْمِيرٍ Those whom they call upon, those whom you call upon, besides him, are not, do not even control or own, even the skin which is on the stone of a date, the thin film that is on the stone of a date they don't do not even own or possess that in tad'uhum la yasma'u du'aakum if you were to invoke them they will not be able to hear you trees do not hear you stones do not hear you the sun does not hear you the moon does not hear you the angels do not hear you when you when when you invoke when you invoke them for things which they have no control or power over the the uh, the the, the jinns do not hear you the uh, righteous do not hear you the prophets who are dead and buried they do not they do not hear you your your invocations your duas for re- with respect to these things and then he continues wala sami'u if they were to hear you and if they were to hear you if they were made to hear you mustajabu lakum they would not be able to respond to you so even if they were made to hear or even if they actually could hear they would not be able to respond to you with what you are asking from them wa yawmal qiyamati yakfuruna bi shirkikum and on the day of judgment they would reject your shirk your commission of shirk setting them up as partners with allah so notice how allah labeled this as shirk their dua to others besides allah allah labeled it as shirk wala yunabbi'uka bi mithla wala yunabbi'uka mithla khabir and no one will inform you as good as the one who is well informed and likewise allah jalla uh, wa ala he said ya ayuhan nas duriba mathalun fastami'u lah in alladhina tad'una min dunillahi lan yakhluqu dubaba wala wajtama'u lah o mankind an example is set forth for you so listen listen to it indeed those whom you call upon besides allah are not able even to create the wing uh, to to create a fly not able to even to create a fly even if they were to gather together for it Many other ayat the Sheikh says there are many other verses which are similar to this in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he explains the complete incapability all of them are incapable those who are called upon besides Allah jalla wa ala they are weak they are incapable they have no power to give anyone anything to give those who who are worshiping them anything even if it is the smallest amount even if it is the skin of a date pit the date stone and likewise they are also incapable of protect of of removing harm from these people or bringing about benefit because they are incapable even with respect to themselves if they cannot help and aid themselves in the situation in which they are in like the people who are in the graves they can't even they cannot even aid themselves how can they aid somebody else 
It does not make any sense. It is absurd. So therefore the Sheikh says, there is no distinction between anyone in this regard. Meaning, whether it is a stone or a tree or an angel or a jinn or a prophet, that which, comb- that which unites all of them is that all of them are completely incapable. Allah has declared everyone that is besides him to be incapable. They do not even own an atom from the heavens or the earth. They do not share with Allah in owning anything in the heavens or the earth. They do not aid and support and help Allah in running or regulating his universe. They have no right to intercede with Allah and to challenge his authority by being able to intercede without permission. So if this is the case, how on earth can anyone who is like this, incapable, powerless, weak, how can they be invoked and asked for something which they do not even possess and which they cannot even achieve for themselves? All of this shows the absurdity of worshipping others besides Allah, irrespective of what that is, whether it is Isa or Uzair, or worshipping stones and trees, every single last one of them, whether they worship the saints or the righteous, every last single one of them have been judged in all of these verses to be mushrikuna billah, to be those who commit shirk with Allah, and all of these deities are incapable, have no control over, uh, over benefit nor harm, which shows the futility of worshipping them, and this is the end of the meaning of what Shaykh Ahmad al-Najmi Rahimahullah Ta'ala has mentioned And with that we'll conclude our lesson today uh, We will leave the explanation of Shaykh Muhammad bin Hadi Hafizahullah for the next lesson Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in